So, after that lovely introduction, who am I? My little nerdy conversation starter there. Um, I'm actually going to change that on here. But, I'm not a technical guy by trade. I came from the U.S. Army Special Operations community. I, I'm not going to stand on this stage. I'll walk around it. Never mind. Thought I'd try it. But. Um, so I came from the special operations community. I did intelligence. I did Wi-Fi, cellular, mobile exploitation, stuff like that. But I'm the guy that you call when you need to find a guy in a country somewhere and then go grab him and throw him in a helicopter and he goes bye-bye for a little while. That's me. I have some technical knowledge, but I am not a technical me. Got out of doing that. I went, got my degree in Spanish which somehow qualified me to now come here and talk to you guys about threat intel and cybersecurity. <laughs> Don't ask me how. Deloitte hired me, uh, so blame them. Um, so I did some time at Deloitte, did some time in industry and financial services, tried to do my own thing. That uh, was awesome and a great learning experience. And now here I am at CrowdStrike. So what do we do at CrowdStrike? So I run the Americas region, North, South America, and Canada, our friends up way north. Um, and what the Threat Advisor team does is we help you guys and, and customers buy things. So I'm just kidding. Uh, we, help, we help customers find fit for purpose solutions, leveraging CrowdStrike threat intelligence. Um, and yeah, so I get to come and talk to people and kind of talk about things that aren't salesy, which is cool. I get to just kind of give you guys the rundown of sort of lay of the land how we see. Next slide. So. What we're going to talk about, kind of going to do a little overview of the e-crime landscape and uh, big game hunting, not endangered African rhinos, but are the CrowdStrike version of big game hunting. Talk a little bit about Wizard Spider, have like a little mini case study from one of our, our healthcare incident response uh, things. It's not super, it's kind of uh, obfuscated, but we'll talk about it. And then some of the best practices and lessons learned. So the focus is going to be kind of heavy on Wizard Spider. That, we didn't have any Wizard Spider t-shirts, but, you know, hey, this was, what was this one? Something? Oh, this is Wicked Spider. It starts with a W-I, close enough, right? So, the obligatory Sun Tzu quote. I won't show you guys. I literally have this tattooed right here. I got it before I went to war the first time. But how does this apply to threat intelligence? Well, in general, these days, we're pretty good at knowing ourselves. We, I mean, well, depends on where you work. Maybe maybe your asset inventory is, leaves a little to be desired. Don't feel bad. You're not the only one. But in general, we tend to know what our networks look like. We know what our endpoints, we know what operating systems we're running. We know what our servers look like, right? So uh, we have a general knowledge of ourselves, and we're pretty good at it. But where we tend to lack is in the knowledge of the adversary. So what are they doing? Who are they targeting? There's a, there's a you know, one of my, uh, I'll throw these in every now and again, and I try to preface it because I die a little inside each time I say it. One of my big four consulting quotes, like, we can't boil the ocean. There's a bunch of adversaries out there. But every adversary doesn't target everybody. They're not targeting everybody. There, there are adversaries that target different verticals. There are adversaries that have different motivations and goals, right? But what we tend to do as sort of good guy defenders is we focus on ourselves, but we don't do a good job of understanding the adversaries, defining the threat. Who is it that's attacking us? And then kind of do, do, does, our, does our business fit in with that? You know, how, And then defining who those are. So what this quote is basically saying is it, it's a much longer one if you go to the actual book. There's like, if you don't know yourself, but you know the enemy, then you win one battle, but not the war. It goes on and on. But what the, the, the crux of this is, is that in this day and age, you can buy every security appliance on the planet, right? You can get firewalls, next gen, AV, EDR, buzzword, bingo, all day long, whatever, insert word here. But you can't effectively defend against everything. So it's incumbent on us as good guys, as defenders, to define the threat. Who are we facing? What is the threat? And how are they doing it? And then sort of prioritize and triage and effectively spend to combat those threats. Because if you try to combat every threat, you're going to fail. And leveraging threat intelligence is one of the really good ways to start to, to get ahead of the attackers. I hate the, the shift left. you got to get ahead of the attacker thing because unless you're going to go out there and be like, oh, well, there's this new hacker group over here and we're going to go drop a JDAM on them, you can't get ahead of the attacker. Because what happens is they come out with something, we block it. They come out with something new. And unless you have like a vat full of milky substance with some ball chips and you know wooden balls that come down that are called precogs, if anybody saw Minority Report, maybe that was just me. But unless you have that capacity, you are never going to get ahead of the attacker. You're always going to be responsive. But what we can do is use the best information that we have to 
prioritize, triage, and effectively deploy our limited resources of both human and capital. Next slide, please. So a little on the e-crime landscape. What's it all about? I thought about putting uh, all about the Benjamins in here, but I didn't want any copyright lawsuits. Now that we're a public company, somebody would do it. So it's all about the money, right? So what do we want to take away from this slide? So we're talking about Wizard Spider. Here's a good one. Late 2018 and throughout 2019, 100 million in Bitcoin. Not a bad gig. I take 100 million right now. Adios, CrowdStrike, right? But what we're what we're looking at is here is so I don't have laser pointer, so you give me up here, Banner Whiting. This is e-crime, right in red. This is nation state. Look at the switch. 2018, 2019, e-crime blowing up. Why? Because people figured out it's a really great way to make money. I had the, the Q2 slide of this over here before, and this says malware downloader or dropper or something along those lines. And that used to be about half the size, but because of the way think threats and, and the way people are deploying these, these uh, types of malware is changing, that's growing. How would you know this if you didn't have some intelligence that kind of pointed you in that direction, right? If you if malware downloaders weren't a thing in Q2, or they weren't as big a thing, but now they are in Q3, maybe you need to start changing your defenses. Maybe you need to change your strategy. Maybe you need to pay more attention to those things. The way we do that is through threat intelligence, right? And you were really good at the slide change thing. I love it. Um, so by industry, here we go. So this was Q1, Q2. So this is from our global threat report, actually, uh, from last year. But as you can see, this went up exponentially across the board to include a bunch of new verticals. Why? Because threat actors realized it is a very lucrative profession to start doing this ransomware thing. And if you can't read it, this one over here is government sled, right? So when I, in a former life, I used to do threat intelligence programs, and so there's a state out west, a very large one, that built this big cyber fusion center, right? And in talking to their constituents, the common theme was, I'm one person, I'm the treasurer, the like city, you know, planner, the whatever, and like fifth on their list of duties was cybersecurity manager, right? So I, I mean like these cities are operating with thousands and thousands of people. Denver got hit with the state of Colorado. They couldn't get a driver's license for like a month in, in Colorado because they got hit with malware, right? These cities have to operate and they're all backed by states. So you have the sort of the perfect storm of very ripe targets that are requiring service and required to provide services to their constituents with weak security controls and weak budgets. So that is why those numbers are blowing up in the government space. Because people aren't paying attention, because they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the domain knowledge to know how to effectively deploy those limited resources. Again, it all comes down to how do you spend the very limited amount of time, people, money that you have effectively. So. One of the things that we've seen in, in this whole criminal enterprise is these ecosystems that are evolving. I look at it kind of like, when they started out, everybody kind of had a good idea. We're gonna try this, we're gonna try that, you know, oh, you know, like I, you know, maybe I'm good at making pizza, you're good at making beer, and we, yeah, I make my pizzas, and like, I do really good pizza, I try to make beer, and I'm like, oh, well, that didn't come out so well. You try to make some pizza, yours doesn't come out so well. But well, we were really good, I was really good at pizza, you were really good at beer, we made some money, but then we get together and we go, well, hey bro, like, I'll make the pizza, you sell the beer, kumbaya, and now we've got like, we've got some leverage and some synergies, right? So, the ecosystem is expanding. What this slide is showing is these are the different uh, e-crime actors that we're tracking. So, Mummy Spider is one of the biggest ones, it's at the hub, it is the purveyor of Emotet. Um, but what's happening is it's, well, this is going to be an ugly one, but the web of these threat actors is expanding and catching and being more all-encompassing. So, you know, some of the trends are saying unprecedented cooperation amongst malware, fraud, black markets, all of that, they're all working together to provide that critical data. So, it might be a black market carter, that's a pretty easy one, but you might be scraping passwords and stuff as well. Well, you sell those to a you know, spam campaign guy who then sells, you know, that access to a malware guy. 
and they've just figured out, guy or gal, they've figured out how to work together cooperatively to sort of leverage what they're good at to create a more robust environment. So what does that do? It allows them to speed up. Like I said, again, we can't get ahead of them unless we go and start dropping real bombs on people. We'll never get ahead, right? And it gives them a significant boost in op tempo or operational tempo because they don't have to do things to get there. If Emotet has a foothold in a network and I want to go in and drop for you on there, if I go and call up my friend at, at, at the Mummy Spider and go, hey, can I get, let me buy access, you know, to this network for, you know, five Bitcoin. We're going to have a 25 Bitcoin ransom. Give me, five, I'll give you five Bitcoins. Install my, my ransomware on there. And it is just a force multiplier for these people to have these robust ecosystems where you can where you can just sort of pick and choose. It's like a menu of like, well, I would like the, the ransomware with the banking trojan, please. So, how, so what do we do about it? What's what is happening to your peers? You know, what what is what is again? This all goes back to intelligence and knowledge and, and information is power. Well, what was it? Uh, GI Joe knowing is half the battle or whatever. Um, so what what's happening to your peers? How are they handling things? What kind of attacks are they seeing? That you can't be spent. You can't spend time in this day and age on things that are light, like whether it's like a Carter stealing forum, like these easy little things. We have to automate it out because there are real significant threats that just completely trump these little things. You have to get some sort of automation into your system that handles these commodity threats, where you're going to spend an inordinate amount of time. You can click one more on that. So. This is just sort of an overview of how complex this web of threat actors is. It's pretty wild when you look at it, and it changes all the time. So, it, you know, these smiley faces and things are just, these things are splitting. So up there, there's BitPamer. Well, they forked out, they did a little code fork, and they created Doppelpamer. And so it went Indrick Spider, and then we got real creative with the name and created Doppelspider <coughs> out of that. But this is just kind of a representation of how complex the ecosystem is and how interconnected things are becoming. Getting really low on the water. The talk's over when the water's out, just saying. <laughs> so wizard spider, here we go. What you all came for. The spider, the myth, the legend. So what do they do? Core development and distribution of TrickBot. It's a old school banking trojan from the... 2016-ish. Um, they are operators of Ryuk and Anchor DNS. Um, they relied heavily for a while. Again, this is going to be a, an Intel thing. Earlier 2019 through Q2, they had almost daily cam spam campaigns. I'll speak correct at some point. Uh, but they used their own internal spam bot to do it. Right? What we've seen sort of towards the end of the year in the emerging trend is that a lot of these operators are actually switching to a, uh, to a downloader model, pivoting to a downloader based model for many of the affiliates. The affiliates are G tagged or group tagged, and that's how they sort of identify the different variants of the malware. But they're going to these downloaders because, again, somebody already did the hard work. They're already on the network, they're already doing the work for you. So I was in the Army, I spent plenty of time working harder, not smarter, and those days are long in the past, and these people are very much more efficient, and they understand that the opportunity to leverage these, these partners is the way to real money, because you can go out and find exactly who it is you want to target, and then target it, and you just pay a small amount. One of the interesting things is, what do we say, $100 million, right, in a year and change? So, yes, they got $100 million, but you have to get that money out. Like, I can't go to the bank and be like, hey, I can't put my ATM card in, and most ATMs, some you can with crypto, but I can't put my card in and extract money from my $100 million of Bitcoin. I can't go buy my Ferrari and all that stuff, right? So they have a very elaborate sort of criminal enterprise that encompasses all the way to the money muling, money laundering perspective. And the uh, last bullet up there was, it was a sort of, it's a, oh man, thanks for going back, but um, it was a, uh, an offshoot of the now defunct Prime Operation Diner. That was the last little one there. So, this is TripBot. It is a banking trojan. So it originally was pretty thin in features. It kind of just did a little credential stealing. It required uh, PowerShell Empire or some other, or 
and now we use Eternal Blue, Eternal Romance. It required other external programs, Cobalt Strike, things like that, in order to conduct advanced reconnaissance lateral movement, all of that kind of stuff. But now they've switched it into a modular based framework. So again, it goes back to that menu of options. It's like, oh, okay, I'll take the, you know, freaking credential harvesting and the recon and network collateral movement, click, 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 download and go. So the framework has significantly changed and become a lot more powerful for operators of TrickBot. Another thing that it does is it leverages SSL and TOR for other obfuscate activities. So if you are not stripping SSL and all of your traffic is pushing through your network, it's encrypted, it becomes, oh, I spelled leverages, is, um, we'll just pretend that D isn't there. I think Christian told me to take it out and I didn't, but hey, the lesson learned. Um, but what that does is you can't see where it's going, so it makes it exponentially harder to defend against. If you have encrypted traffic going through your network and you're not and you're not stripping SSL and decrypting it, you're not going to be able to run a snort rule against it and see, or you're not going to be able to, you just won't see the traffic. And then you throw in Tor and it just makes it even more fun, right? So what do they do? They inject into legitimate process, service service.exe. Well, that sucks for us, right? Not only can we not see it, but it's leveraging child processes of legitimate programs. I don't know what that means, but I put it on the slide, so it's okay. I promise you it's true. I don't know what it means. Don't ask me to explain. All right, next slide. <coughs> Ryuk. So this is the sort of new um, Ryuk thing. They used to have a very long-winded like, form letter that like, had a little narrative and stuff. It's like, you've, you've been infected with Ryuk, and now it's bad for your business, and bad things happen, blah, blah, blah. They got smart. So they used primarily Proton and Tutanoa um, as their, their BTC addresses. But here's a good one. In its first two weeks of known existence, it made almost half a million dollars in two weeks for some buddy who probably put in a very limited amount of work. It's a variant of the, depending on your pronunciation, Hermes or Hermes ransomware. <coughs> Totally up to you how fancy you are. If you like high end luxury goods, you probably say Hermes. If you are into computers, you probably say Hermes. So, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll figure it out together. Uh, it leverages on some Metasploit or Cobalt Strike for reversing PowerShell and, and MediCast for lateral. Things to know. And why are these things important? Well, you use PSExec for privilege escalation. What's up? What else is useful to know here? Well, these things, nobody's going to remember this. So this. They're recording. The slides will be out there. You guys can. Can see this later. But knowing where these things are, are going, so they create, create files in the name of public and unique ID, do not remove. So you're able to sort of take some of these artifacts based on what we, what we or other vendors or whoever, what security researchers, incident responders, and intel groups put together based on other attacks. And that's, again, that's how we start to build our defenses against these. If you are in, if you're in an industry where you would potentially be a target for Wizard Spider, this kind of stuff is important to know, right? Because the more information we have, the better we are able to defend. Because again, lastly, we cannot ever beat the attacker without real bombs. <coughs> Anchor DNS. It's actually called Anchor, I think colloquially, it's Anchor DNS. It uh, came out mid-2018. So what it does is it looks for POS devices on the network and starts to harvest credentials from those. So the, it goes along usually with TrickBot, and it also has been seen a lot with Megacortex and Locker Goga 2. I'm sure everybody will remember those names. Much like APT 37, 19, Wizard, and all the other nomenclature that people spend a lot of money marketing. So okay. we'll get there eventually, though. Uh, what does it do, and why is it called Anchor DNS? Well, it conducts all of its C2 command and control operations via DNS requests and responses. So if you are not paying attention to that, and you have a bunch of POS systems, because you're a business that does credit card transactions on POSs, maybe DNS monitoring might be something you might want to start looking at. So the, again, this is all just little nuggets of information that help us make more effective and smarter business decisions, right? And it is installed as a system service named NetTCP service. Next slide. So, as we said earlier, the download or malware, 
When you look up here, we had golf as this big, big long thing. Daily campaigns in early 2019 through whatever. Uh, one of those reasons is Emotet likes to take breaks around Russian holidays. I don't know why, but they seem to be less active around Russian holidays. Pure coincidence, I'm sure. 100% sure it's coincidence, but, they're, but they need to make money still, right? So they relied on their, their little go spam campaign. But as we said, it's becoming a much more popular method. Why? Because somebody else is doing all the work for you. Those people are already on the networks. Uh, it's simple, rapid, and more secure. So rather than have to worry about your malware being caught up by our preventative measures, by CrowdStrike, NextGen AV, or Carbon, <laughs> um, or whoever it is, whatever is out there, catching it, and then providing, again, people like me, and, well, the nerdier people, the nerdier version of me, information that they can then use to turn into actionable intelligence for you. So it helps them to be more secure in their operations because it decreases the likelihood that they will be intercepted and discovered. Because, obviously, somebody's already on the network, somebody already probably has admin, somebody has done all of the work for them. Certain trick by GTAG operators, group tags, are using it as their preferred method. And it appears, to use the uh, estimated words of probability, with high confidence we estimate that these downloaders will continue to be the future for many of the wizard spider and trick bot operators. Here is, oh, 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 just kidding, oh. just kidding. All right, so here is the distribution thing, and I'm sure everybody can read this. Who's got 2020 vision? Sarah, can you read? No, just kidding. Uh, I can't even read it, I'm standing a foot away. So these little blobs are the actual G tags of, of those different variants. But these are the different <laughs> systems that it uses. And then down there, Mummy, Lunar, and Scully Spider. Again, just kind of highlighting the interoperability and the, and the connectivity of these disparate threat actors, right? Now you can go to the next one. So Ghost Fam, so they, like, again, they still use it. It's always been kind of a, a secondary thing, but again, you guys probably can't see this. Uh, we need some 1080p 4K, but those are actual attachments, dates, timestamps of different uh, files that were sent via Go. So what it does is it goes in, it goes into your Outlook, it harvests your credentials, and it harvests all of the information, all of your contacts, all of the email to, from, sent, and then it uses Outlook to start spamming out. Shockingly appropriate for a name of a spam campaign and what it does. Uh, they're using uh, URL redirects to obfuscate the payload. So rather than just going straight away to download bad stuff here.com, they're using a little bit of tradecraft to help um, help you know kind of obfuscate that and fight that. One of the things that we uh, tend to see is invoice order or delivery themes. Any guesses as to why that is? Yes, ma'am. Right, well, let's think about the level the level of employees that are going to get something, hey, the package arrived, right? We're not, it's not the, you know, it's not our, our, our SOC isn't getting, you know, our SOC 3 analyst is not getting, you know, hey, we just sent you all of the, the paper for this month. Here's your invoice or whatever, right? So it usually tends to target less knowledgeable, less cyber savvy and secure people. And like you said, it increases the likelihood of somebody who doesn't really know what to do, doesn't know what to look for, of actually clicking on it. But here's one little fun nugget. It uses HTTP over port 2050 to communicate with the C2 server. So again, if you think you could be a potential target for Wizard Spider or this spam campaign, maybe that's port to look at more often. Maybe it's you know, just, just a little fun facts. Maybe you use 2050 for some vitally important function in your network and you can't do anything to shut it down. Well, why not? Figure something out. But that's what it uses. So it's just, a little, again, it's just one more piece of knowledge that allows us to be a little bit better. Next slide. So. How am I doing on time, people that work here? We're probably looking at 7.30. So, oh, okay, cool. So you should be good. All right, well, we got a lot of time. Uh, 
So this is a sort of visual representation of a healthcare um, incident response thing that we went through. And then I'm going to ask you guys, since we have plenty of time here, to kind of point out some of the things where they could have done things better. So Emeth had a foothold. They delivered that got delivered via email. They delivered TrickBot, right? So TrickBot, Banking Trojan, does collection and reconnaissance. Next slide. TrickBot. Again, now we have modules, right? So it used its SOX module to tunnel PowerShell Empire traffic. <clears throat> okay, well, that doesn't sound good. Uh, well, what did that allow them to do? Well, they then moved laterally using RDP. Great, we should definitely have RDP enabled on everything because it needs it. <laughs> really important RDP, right? So then, what do we do? PS exec. Oh, that's never been misused before ever, uh, is used to push the Ryuk binary to individual hosts, and sad face, that's what you get, right? So where in this whole little catastrophe could people have done something maybe a little bit better, anyone? We'll do a little knowledge sharing here. Yes, sir? Don't click on every item in your email. Don't click or do click. Don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, OCD, a, that man, that's a generally a good thing. I mean, hey, you know what? Like, you got somebody's got to test it, right? <laughs> you, you, you're the computer. You're the computer guy. You can test it. Yes, sir. In the back. I would say for the PS Exec part, I'd probably use Microsoft Labs to have <laughs> unique local admin passwords because then PS Exec wouldn't work. Good local, good password policies, right? Least privilege, least access. Sort of the basic hygiene. Anybody else? Any other fun, fun facts? Suggestions? Yes, ma'am. What about like VPN and two sets of um, two-factor two another, another very good option. Yes, sir. Uh, for the email attachment, uh, instead of using the DOC, just uh, renaming it to the DOCX, we started seeing that towards the end, of, or to the, short, to the latest version of email set. A lot of our users ended up figuring out if it was the outdated DOC, it was probably malicious, so they didn't open it. Kind of like when you get an email from Capital One, but you look at the address and it's like, Joe Smith won at Gmail. Yeah. What I'm driving at, at the end of the day for this, is that, like, the basics. Man, it's all about the basic things that we've talked about for years in cybersecurity, right? Like, least privilege, good password policies, having, you know, user awareness. So, next slide. Talk a little about the best practices, and then we'll hit uh, a little question and answer type stuff. So there you go, boom. User awareness, you win. It's the number one thing. Why, like you said, people, you know, if we have those types of things that are common, you know, a that somebody's admin or a shipping supply clerk or whoever it is, they're not really caring too much about like, Oh, well, let me go and see if this is a bad email, and I'm going to check it, and I'm going to forward it, whatever. They're like, I've got 9,000 things in the warehouse today. Like, I'm just going to click. I need to pay this, whatever it is, right? But teaching your users basic cyber hygiene is vitally important. So I, I was in the training space for way, way longer than I ever wanted to be. Don't ever ask me to do training again, and somehow I just can't seem to avoid it. So I, you hear me say this now, in six months I'll come back and be like, yeah, do training, no big deal. Um, but it really is important. But what is more important than like create spending $110,000 to license some PowerPoint set of user slides that you know you sit there and click through as fast as you can while you're like scrolling the gram with the left hand, you're like, go, go, go. Like, 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 selfie, doing training. Uh, make it entertaining, make it interactive, make it, I, I hate to use this analogy, my dad is a fairly old guy, I think he'll be 79 this year, sounds about right, yeah, 79. Uh, so when I look at training and the way I always approached it was, what, how do I say this in a way where I'm not gonna get a phone call from my dad an hour later asking me how to do it again? And that's kind of how I approach training. It's like, how, does my, how do I explain this in a way that my 79-year-old dad can do it and be successful? It needs to be short, to the point, relevant, and engaging. So that's my training spiel. 
Never again. Um, <laughs> asset management and software inventory. Again, this is nothing that you guys don't know, but in general, I mean, like I said, in general, we're good about knowing our own networks, but let's be honest, like, who's, who in here is like, no, no, everything on my network, 100%, our asset management is pristine, we've got complete visibility into our network, nothing gets by me. Here, wait for the crickets, because I, or, I, I won't call you a liar, but like, if I were to be that person, I maybe would call you a liar. We can't know everything, but we can be better at it. We can do things to get better at it. Software inventory, know what you're running, know what's vulnerable, which leads into vulnerability and patent management, right? I came from the banking industry in the worst two years of my life, uh, never again. Uh, and sometimes you just can't update things. You know, it, it comes down to a business decision, and, and these are risk based decisions. Do we want to take this? Windows 98 server offline, so, but where it's going to cost us $7 billion in equity trades, or do we just leave it running and if somebody breaches us, it's only gonna cost us a half a billion dollars. I'll say 6.5. But, in general, vulnerability and patch management is super easy across most of these things. With good policies in place, good systems and SOPs in place, we can do this and we can be fairly successful. It is such an easy thing to do, and it is most assuredly the easiest thing for an attacker to exploit is just out-of-date software. So easy, but yet we see it pretty much every day, right? Multi-factor, who was multi-factor? That was you, two-factor, good job. And privilege management, kind of over there with the, the least privilege, uh, least access stuff. Multi-factor and privilege management, don't have a local admin password. It shouldn't be admin password. <laughs> it's my suggestion, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what to do, it's just my, my two cents, don't make it admin password, at least use like an at sign and a zero for the <laughs> more if you're gonna do it. Um, be elite hacks or, and all that. And then uh, password protection for your endpoint security software. A lot, of these, a lot of these malware are out there looking for ways to bypass your Endpoint security stuff. So if you have weak passwords, no passwords on your endpoint security, they can just go out there and go, bloop, you're done, and then free reign. Next slide. So basic hygiene matters. Look behind, beyond. I want to look behind. Well, don't do that. Uh, strength and defense against the modern attack. So non malware based attacks become more prevalent. But what can we look for? Unusual use of native tools. That seems pretty self explanatory, right? But how many people are actually out there? actively monitoring for it. We're getting real close to this bottle being done, just that why I don't know if we're gonna make the 730, but. PowerShell. How many users on your network should be using PowerShell? On a regular basis. One. One, maybe, right? <laughs> Even then, I hope they know what they're doing. Uh, but it's not a lot. If you've got 55 people on your network using PowerShell, and you're in a 200 person company, and you are not like an active, like, red team, purple team, blue team, some sort of cyber nerd company, you may have a problem. Uh, windows and non-windows, again, it's gonna go back to know your environment. <coughs> Maybe all of your Windows systems are protected. What are you doing about your Linux systems? What are you doing about your Mac? You can't hack Mac, right? <laughs> Not so much anymore. I just got my first Mac this year when I joined CrowdStrike. And a little bit of an embarrassing transition trying to give a presentation when I don't know how to like scroll up and down on the screen and all that. But like, you can't hack it, so it was all good. Um, and then, right, all right, we're good. Alternate methods of code execution positions. So, yeah, these are things that once you get the basics down, you can start to do this. But everybody wants to be the cool guy. You can have the greatest, like, oh, nobody uses PowerShell on our network, but, well, you don't know where 25% of these devices on your network are, so great job on, like, something that is pretty much completely irrelevant because 25% of your network is undocumented and completely exposed, right? Next one, the 11060 challenge. Uh, I don't have my little uh, breakout time slide, but, what this is all about is one time, one minute to detect, 10 minutes to investigate, one hour to remediate. Why that is, is because actors are becoming so fast in what they're doing. I want to say Russia, I don't know, <coughs> you might be able to correct me when I'm wrong. I want to say hour, 18 minutes, 
something like that. 18 minutes. 18 minutes. Somebody was an hour and 18. 18 minutes for Russia to get in. And, and, and so what breakout time is is, is, is is what we call achieving lateral movement through the network. So it takes up 18 minutes. Uh, everybody else is around there. I think the e-crime, the spider family is in the early four-hour section. <coughs> four hours, 12 minutes maybe. Don't quote me. Oh, you can. I'm going to get fired over it yet. Oh, I love you. I don't know who you are. <laughs> You must feel like hearing my voice, sir, because you God, just added another 30 minutes. Nobody else knows who he is either. So <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to come up and introduce yourself? Dave Taylor, U.S. Grip. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dave Taylor. You're my, you're, you're an owner gentleman, sir. Um, so we say this because <clears throat> actors are getting faster, and if we can't respond in time, once it happens, once it's, once that data is exfilled, it's too late. Sure, we can go back, we can stop the breach, we can go back, do IR, we can clean it up, we can recover, yay, we won, and we, we didn't have too big of a failure. Hi, sweetheart, how are you? What are you doing? Oh, awesome. You want to you come up and talk about cyber? I don't know what that means. All right, we'll teach you. We'll teach you later. All right, so long story short, we have to get faster on our defenses, and we have to do things in a much more, with greater urgency. Speed, surprise, violence of action, we used to say in the Army. Uh, but it's, the, it, it's required, we have to. So next slide. I'm almost done, sir. I, I feel like that's the, the like time card coming up. Um, the last thing we can do is we can look to partner organizations. Again, we have a shortage of resources, whether that's time, money, or people, right? We can't do everything ourselves. If you're a one-person show and you're expected to defend an entire network, well, good luck. I, I always say, like, CISO is the most masochistic job out there because you are the first one on the chopping block when something goes wrong. So if you really like that one, good on you. But behind every attack, there's a human adversary. So we have to have both human and automated defenders. And we have to enable ourselves with the most up-to-date current information about those human adversaries that are behind those attacks. They change TTPs in response to technical controls. Sort of like that point I made. We can't get ahead of them. We block them, they come up with something new. We block that, we come up with something new. It is, if somebody's got an example of where that is not the reality, I would love to hear it, but that is. It requires effective, dedicated, capable security and part partnering with best-in-class service providers whether that's crash strike or whoever it is, but leveraging partners, leveraging other people, leveraging ISACs, getting as much as you can out of the community. We're generally pretty good about sharing, you know, like we gotta make money somehow, but when it comes to a lot of, especially from the government side, Infraguard, ISACs, all that stuff, we're generally pretty good about sharing. So leverage those in order to make you more effective. The first step is understanding what, who's targeting you. So the most simplest, the last point, I think this is almost done, the last point I have is, Go through an exercise of who am I and who is going to target me. And take that list and then start to build your like most likely, your top 10. These are the most likely things. Everybody's like, oh, I got the oh, lost the top 20. Well, if 17 of those techniques are not used by the attackers and you're a, I live in Houston, so we'll just say you're an oil refinery company and the number one attacker that does pretty much nothing but oil refinery exploits and hacking, if they only use three out of those top 20, but there's 10 other things that they do, having good OWASP top 20 controls is really irrelevant at the end of the day, right? So knowing yourself and knowing your adversary, think of my tattoo, it's in Chinese as well. So the day's actually in there, I translated, I speak Korean, I translated into Chinese, we're good. I made sure, did not want like, happy spring worm guy, <laughs> whatever, whatever they threw on there, and like, oh, look at that dude. Um, all right, I think that's it.